It was my birthday the other week. I spent the weekend in Wales, in the Brecon Beacons. It's quite easy to socially distance there. It might have looked a bit suspicious that I arrived the day before Wales' borders closed to people from high-risk parts of England, but it was just timing, honest. And I left the day before Wales was to announce a new lockdown of their own. It felt a bit ominous driving back to England. We drove through some high-risk areas where there were large signs alerting us to it. The holiday was booked last minute, but even then I wondered if it would go ahead. It did, and without a problem. But only just. You see, October 2020 has been one of the most eventful months for coronavirus in England so far. Hence a second video this month. At the time of posting this video, Ireland, Scotland and Wales have all announced lockdowns. Proper lockdowns, intended to cut coronavirus cases down to manageable levels. It's only England that hasn't. It has introduced measures of its own, intended to tackle problem areas, but I personally feel it's only going to buy us some more time before a more drastic, country-wide lockdown is needed here as well. I think we all expected a second wave at some point over the winter, but I didn't expect it to be quite so soon, and so sudden. Let's rewind a bit. £12 billion have been spent on the UK's test and trace system, but it turns out that sometimes you don't get what you pay for, because apparently they were recording the daily figures to an Excel sheet, and there were so many it went over the limits of Excel's databasing capabilities, and as a result under-recorded the daily entries from September the 25th onwards. To be honest, it sounds like the sort of mistake I'd make when dabbling with something in my spare time. The difference is that I'm not being paid £12 billion to get it right. But don't worry, they've now set the database up properly, by splitting that Excel sheet into two separate ones. This has allowed us to see the actual daily figures, and much to our horror, they're quite big. Some of the worst in Europe, actually. So what has happened? Cases have boomed across the country. Some places still aren't that bad. Cases in the southwest, where I'm from, remain low, for instance. But there are some massive hotspots elsewhere, particularly up north in places such as Liverpool and Manchester, and local lockdowns have been rolled out in these areas. So why are these places so badly affected? I don't think it's down to a single reason. They're large cities with high population densities. They are the poorer parts of England. Nightlife there actually exists. And I feel like London was seen as the place where it was needed to be kept under control, and of course that's where the people making the decisions are based. So that might have impacted when the first lockdown started and ended. Looking at this time lapse, it looks like the North never really recovered from the first wave. So perhaps all these factors have contributed to the issues faced up there. The media has certainly had a field day with Liverpool. The day before lockdown kicked in, thousands were out on the streets to party while bars were still open. But coronavirus doesn't care. Numbers in Liverpool are only going to get worse before they get better. Whereas earlier in the year the whole country was in lockdown, this time around the government wants most of England to remain open, instead only locking down places that have had high numbers of cases. It sounds good in theory, but in practice I feel like there are already too many cases in too many places, and they're better off just locking everywhere down again to try and regain control of the situation. Plus, the country keeps changing the rules. They used to have this five-stage alert system, but they threw all that away and swapped it out for a three-tier system, which is what they're currently using. Rather depressingly, the lowest of this new system is medium risk, which still requires masks in shops, a maximum of six people per gathering, and a 10pm curfew on pubs and restaurants. Where I live is in this lowest tier. Some places like London are now in tier two, which is high risk. I suspect this will be of limited effectiveness because it doesn't appear to change a lot. And the last, third tier is very high risk, which is where the likes of Liverpool are right now. It's as close to a lockdown as the system can get, but even this isn't as strict as a proper lockdown is. You can still buy a drink from a pub, but you must do so with a meal now. People aren't supposed to meet up, nor are they supposed to travel beyond their local area. If you ask me, I don't think this is going to be enough to contain it. Hospitals in Liverpool are already at capacity, and I only see it getting worse before it gets better. And it's not like this tier 3 is even a set standard. What happens is Boris Johnson goes to the local council and says, hey guys, your cases are too high, please go into local lockdown. To which the council replies with, no we don't want to because that will hurt our economy, please give us more funding and we'll consider it. And so begins this weird negotiation that ends with a unique set of rules for each area. For example, despite both being the highest risk tier 3 areas, gyms in Liverpool have to shut, while gyms in Lancashire can remain open. It's a mess, and these negotiations are slowing down actions that should have happened weeks ago. I'm normally quite accepting of the government's decisions because I acknowledge that they have more information about it than I do, 
but it's beginning to feel a lot like it did before the first lockdown, where the government is slow to react to rapid change, and it's all beginning to spiral out of control. And it turns out I'm not alone in feeling this way. On September the 21st, the government's own scientific advisers called for a short lockdown. For whatever reason, this advice was ignored. And now, almost a month later, it's clear that cases have surged. If you look at the daily cases, you might think this second wave is worse than the first, but I don't think it is. Just yet. The first wave only documented hospitalised cases, while this time they're doing a better job of testing anybody displaying symptoms, so these recent daily figures are probably still four times lower than they were during the first wave. But remember, this time we still haven't started a proper lockdown, so for a few weeks I can only see the cases heading upwards. Who knows how high they'll get this time. And there's been a change in attitude. Earlier this year I think everybody agreed that we needed to do something about the pandemic, but all these months in it seems like attitudes are changing. All across Europe there are protests against lockdowns. The anti-mask movement is gaining momentum. People used to be good at wearing masks, but now I see so many who don't bother or who wear them under their nose. I'm not sure if they're doing this deliberately or if they're just stupid, but it's clear that it's no longer us versus the virus. People are turning on each other, students are getting the blame in the UK, and an increasing number of people are saying that they'll ignore a lockdown if it happens again. Back in the spring I found the clapping for NHS stuff cringy but I'd rather have that back than this finger-pointing blame culture I see happening now. It's like the world is tearing itself apart and nothing can be agreed upon anymore. Two people could watch the same video and come to two entirely different outcomes on it. Every single thing I've said in my video so far has become a topic of debate. It's like it doesn't matter what is said, every point must be countered, the water must be muddied, and you must walk away from something you thought was right not knowing what the truth is anymore. It's infuriating. So I've decided to do the only thing I can think of doing, and that is to carry on talking about how I see the world, and to let the future be the judge of what I say, because it's becoming increasingly evident that the present has absolutely no clue whatsoever. But if you want a taste of this madness, simply search for any interview with Bill Gates on YouTube, sort the comments by new, and prepare to be terrified by how literally 95% of comments think he's responsible for it. I don't get it, and I don't think I want to. This kind of misinformation or conspiracy driven paranoia might have been a problem for a while, but I feel like with coronavirus it's finally bubbled to the surface and suddenly the world has been forced to see just how ugly things have become. You'd think, as a reasonable person, you should listen to what these people are saying and to consider whether there's some truth to it, but I realised long ago that they won't give you the same respect in return. I still believe in experts. Until this year I think that would have been a reasonable thing to say, but even now I know it's going to cause people to argue with me about how I'm buying into the system or whatever. But I don't care. I still think that people who have degrees and experience in a field should be heard louder than somebody who's only opinionated, loud and confident about the topic. But I don't know how many people share this sentiment. As Michael Gove put it so eloquently, I think people of this country have had enough of experts. I said in my last video that Donald Trump had coronavirus and it now looks like he's making a recovery. I'm sure he's had the best and latest treatments, but within just a week or so he was back making speeches and showing up at rallies again, which he's needed to do if he wants to stand a chance in the upcoming US elections, which are scheduled for early next month. Whether he wins or loses, his performance this month will play a large part in it, and coronavirus has had an impact, whether he wanted it to or not. I felt I needed to mention all this in this video, since I documented the lead up to his infection last time, and received a lot of pretty nasty comments about it too, I might add. Around the end of September, I had a week or so where I'd breathe in and think, does this feel normal? Is there a burning sensation? Or have I just eaten too much? I didn't have any other symptoms and honestly don't even know if that was one itself. I'm pretty confident it wasn't anything, and nobody I've hung out with has reported anything either. But I haven't been alone in worrying about this sort of stuff. Ask anybody and they'll remember a time this year where they felt unwell, and have asked themselves if it could be coronavirus. We're all just hyper aware of this sort of thing this year, but we can't just hide away every time this happens. We have to find ways of carrying on. I mention this because the worry about coronavirus isn't just about what it'll do to you, but what it could do to the people you know if you unknowingly gave it to them. Imagine you started displaying symptoms the day after meeting with friends and family, and how guilty you'd feel. If only you had had the foresight to know that you were going to fall ill. If only you had identified sooner that your coffee tasted strange, or that cough you had in three in the morning one night meant something. Unless you've locked yourself away from society this year, you'll have taken some degree of risk. You don't need to have broken the guidelines to have risked exposure. Every social interaction you have is like a contract, a promise that you think you're safe, and the hope the other person is as well. 
and it does make you wonder how you'd react upon discovering that you've spread it to others. The embarrassment, the blame and the resentment that comes with it. Of the 16,000 or so new cases in the UK every day, how many more were too ashamed to be tested? How many more stayed quiet, or flew under the radar for whatever reason? How many surprise cases are because people are too embarrassed to admit that they've spread it, or to have been honest about where they've been or who they've been with? What sort of statistic will you be?